Magna Carta is often described as the foundation for many of the rights and liberties that we enjoy today. So what exactly was Magna Carta, and how did it come about? In 1215, King John was on the throne. Due to his policies, he was very unpopular, and the barons of the land were rebelling. The crisis concerned King John, who was, I think, every bit as bad as his historical reputation would suggest. John is... He's a fascinating man, really, really interesting, because um, his reputation is just, you know, the worst. In 1204, King John had lost Normandy, which had been united with England since the Norman Conquest. That discredited him. He levied very heavy taxes to try and recover it, and he failed. But the tax bill still had to be paid. So in origin... Magna Carta, the crisis that led to Magna Carta, began as a sort of tax revolt in the north of England and in East Anglia, and then it spread. By the beginning of 1215, England was in a state of civil war. Disaffection was spreading. In May, London went over to the rebels, and who controlled London then was as crucial as who controls London today or in any other period of English history. Barons had got control of London, and above all, the Londoners were prepared to bankroll them. So they were in business. Eager to secure their rights against a despotic king, the barons met King John at Runnymede, forcing him to agree to a charter that offered them certain protections. This was the first version of the Magna Carta. How did the meeting come to happen at Runnymede? Quite simply, the barons were advancing west, out of London, along the old Roman road to the crossing point of the Thames at Staines. King John had come up from Odium in Hampshire to Windsor. So the king was at Windsor, the barons were at Staines, they split the difference and met halfway. It becomes this token thing. It's, it's, um, you know, John dies in 1216, having already rejected Magna Carta, he's already written off to the Pope who says, yeah, you don't have to sign that. So they've, it's already been annulled. So only a couple of months in, it doesn't mean anything. The Civil War continues, he drops dead, his son comes to power, and his son, the first thing his son does is sign it. Say, yeah, okay, fine, I abide by these rules. And then his son comes to maturity, reaches an adulthood, signs it again. And then every king in the middle, medieval era effectively sort of signs at the beginning of the coronation and says, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be a good king. And it becomes this ritual that everyone agrees to, to sign up to. The importance of Magna Carta is very clear. It established the principle of due process of law, freedom under the law. It placed the king under the law, And for the king then, we can read executive authority today. But I think two points. First of all, the clauses that survive on the statute book today are the important ones, the ones that are affirmed universal principles. Clause 39, which laid down the principle of due process of law, and Clause 40, which said to no one shall we say or deny right or justice. They are still on the statute book, and their message is universal. But I think the second point that needs to be made is that the importance of Magna Carta in the long term is symbolic. It transcended its origins. It's more than the sum of its individual parts. It's what it means for us. It set a standard, and that standard is one against which we can judge the governments of any age in any place. Magna Carta now has become this global brand, this identity, this this thing that you can talk about in almost any nation and say Magna Carta and they go, oh yeah, Magna Carta, that makes sense. And so there's now a Maori Magna Carta and there's a Magna Carta for women. Uh, each, you know, each nation has a, its own interpretation of this peculiarly English document from 800 years ago.